Well, we're back to the countdown with Dean Kirk, and I apologize for the, my hair being as messy as it is. I just, it's one of the, my hair is just hard to control. What happened is we're having an early winter outbreak here in Alabama, believe it or not. The average high for this time of year in Alabama is in the 70s. We're having highs of tomorrow about 59, and going down to freezer tonight, I wore a hoodie this afternoon, and while I wear a hoodie, it just messes my hair all up, and I put a ton of water on here, but it doesn't seem to help. So, again, I apologize. I hope it's not too distracting or anything. But anyway, uh, well, that's the least you need to know. Let's go to the song at number 13, up five from 18 on this fancy playlist. Whitney Houston, superstar Whitney Houston. Didn't we almost have it all? August 29th, 1987, fancy playlist. I tell you, she could do no wrong back in the 80s with an amazing voice. She had about seven or eight number one records. This would be her fifth. Her fifth number one single, I mean, 1985, 86, 87, and even going into the 90s, uh, she she was just, well, definitely a mass appeal artist, although unfortunately in the 2000s, uh, she declined, and well, it's, it's really a shame, really a shame. I remember, I think I, think I watched her last video, uh, video she put out in 2009, and well, it, it's tragic. But let's go back to the golden age of Whitney Houston at this song at number 13. Now, let's, oh, I'm going to throw the curtain wide open and go to the people behind the scenes. Show the people behind the scenes who helped make this record. Two songwriters want to mention Will Jennings and Michael Mazur, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. Will Jennings, a very distinguished songwriter from Texas, a lyricist. He's written things for Steve Winwood, The Crusaders, and B.B. King. Michael Mazur started writing songs. Well, back in the day, back in the 70s, might have been earlier than that, but uh, in the 70s, Michael Mazur, he teamed up with Richard Curry, wrote the song somewhere in the night covered by Helen Reddy and several years later Barry Mallow hit up on that record made it to a hit he also uh I believe it was Richard Kerr as well uh Michael Mazza wrote another song by Barry Mallow looks like we made it back in the spring and summer of 1977 wrote that one and uh tonight I celebrate my love he wrote that touch me in the morning by Diana Ross back in 73 he wrote that song he wrote a runner-up I, I, I forgot about this record Absolutely forgot about it. Winter of 1973, 1974, a runner-up to, uh, uh, what was that name of that Diana Ross record? I I'm, I'm overheating again. My memory's just blowing up. It's just running on all, oh boy. I just, time out, time out, time out. I'll be right back. Yeah, the song was Touch Me in the Morning. The runner-up was uh, one of the runner-ups of that one. Last time I saw it by Diana Ross back in late 73, early 74. Also written by Michael Mazur with Jerry Goffin. Michael Mazur wrote a big record. One of Whitney Houston's, might have been her first top 10. Might have been. I'm not sure. I'll have to double check. Uh, the billboard, the old billboard, the chart data on that. But uh, he wrote the song, Saving All My Love For You, Whitney Houston. He wrote that one with Jerry Goffin. Jerry Goffin, who teamed up with Carole King and wrote all those great songs back in the early 60s. Uh, songs like, uh, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? And uh, but he teamed up with uh, with uh, Michael Mazur, wrote that song, Saving All My Love. Greatest love of all, Michael Mazur, 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 he written that one as well. And now here's what happened. Clive Davis, the head of Arista Records, he knew of Michael Mazur's reputation, and he invited him to a place called the Sweetwater Club in New York City. Wendy Houston was performing that night, and Michael Mazur, he came, he watched her perform. One of the songs that Whitney Houston did was uh, The Greatest Love of All, which uh, Michael Mazur had either written or co-written. And as a matter of fact, after the performance, uh, Whitney Houston spoke with Mazur. She said, look, this is one of my favorite records, uh, Greatest Love of All. And Clive Davis... He asked Mazur, hey, would you like to write for Whitney? Would you like to produce for Whitney? And here's the thing you've got to understand about Clive Davis, the head of Arista Records. He's worked with a whole bunch of big artists, all the way from Janis Joplin, Simon and Garfunkel, to Whitney Houston. He signed Whitney Houston to Arista in 81, back in 1981, all the way down to, uh, he worked with Kelly Clarkson, and, uh, 
He signed up Whitney Houston. And here's the thing. He knows, Clive Davis knows how to hook up a song with an artist. He's had a reputation for that. One stellar example that might amaze you, the song Mandy by Barry Manilow. It was Clive Davis who discovered that song and, and wanted Barry Manilow to record it. Now, Mandy was called Brandy. It was originally called Brandy, done by Scott English, but... Uh, Clive Davis thought that would be a great first hit for Barry Manilow and make it into even more of a ballad. And he hooked up another song. It was for somebody else that uh, Clive Davis did. Oh, yeah, that re that reminds me. I think I read somewhere. I read his biography years ago. Uh, Clive Davis, major record mogul. Uh, record, uh, well, re well, record mogul. And he... he <laughs> Simon and Garfunkel, when they finished that album, was it Bookends? It was in 1969. They, I'm not sure of the name of the album. Don't quote me on that. But uh, Simon and Garfunkel, at least they thought that Cecilia should be the first single off that album. Because that to them, that was the hit off the album. Of course, that's true. That, that song was a hit. But Clive Davis said, no, nah, no, not so fast. Let's do Bridge Over Troubled Water. Let's make that the first single off the album. And Dead Burn It went to number one on Billboard's Hot 100. How about that? So Clive Davis just, just has that reputation. Got Michael Massey to work on this album. Uh, got song right for Whitney Houston. But now, uh, didn't we almost have it all? Boy, I tell you, it's kind of confusing reading two sources of how this song came about. Basically, Will Jennings and Mike, well, Will Jennings was working on this song on and off, writing bits and pieces of the song. He'd write a bit, he'd write a bit of the song in England. He'd write another bit of the song in Nashville. And Michael Mazur was working on it a little bit too, but he would be working on something else. He'd be producing something else or he'd be traveling. And it just, the song just didn't, didn't fall together for a long time, for about a year or two. As a matter of fact, those two guys, they ran up a phone bill of $200 in Nashville. Now, could, could, could understand, this is before the age of the cell phones and the androids and all that. This is back in the age of landlines and cell phones were still in its infancy back in the day, back in the mid, mid to late 80s. So they ran up this $200 phone bill. But... It was worth it in the end. Another number one hit on the pop charts for Whitney Houston. And Whitney Houston was so big. It's just, see, here's the thing. Uh, she, even though she started declining in the 2000s, uh, in 2001, she signed what was then the biggest contract in music history, a huge contract in 2001, an eight-album deal for $100 million, $100 million deal. She sold over $60 million worth of albums in the U.S. That might be a conservative figure. God knows how much that is when you consider the world. Mazur, he wrote, he also wrote the song Miss You Like Crazy. Michael Mazur did. Will Jennings, Michael Mazur, Clive Davis, Whitney Houston, all coming together, making this hit record at number 13 on my fantasy playlist of uh, August 29th, 1987. Whitney Houston, didn't we almost have it all? Up five from number 18. <laughs> 